We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrix. Joining me today is Mike Singleton, Senior Analyst and Founder at Invictus Research. Thanks for joining me today, Mike. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, Tom. So, Mike, as you're a business cycle analyst, you pay close attention to the constituent parts of the cycle, being the growth cycle, the inflation cycle, and the policy cycle. So if you could give us a refresher on this, give us a rundown on the importance of these parts and which is dominant at this time. Right. So that's a that's a great question, Tom. Thank you again for having me. Uh, like you said, at Invictus, we're business cycle investors, and that's kind of a general phrase. So we can uh, define it a little bit better. At Invictus, we define the business cycle as having three constituent sub-cycles, the real growth cycle, the inflation cycle, and the monetary policy cycle. And the reason that we focus on the business cycle and then those three variables in particular is that they drive the vast majority of the price action if you look across asset classes. So the performance of stocks as a group, bonds as a group, commodities, currencies, it's really driven by pretty much just those three variables. And even at the level of individual securities, individual stocks, the business cycle can drive upward of 70% of the price action. So one of the highest leverage activities you can do as an investor or an allocator is to understand the business cycle and to develop a view in terms of where we're going next. And that's what we spend pretty much all of our time doing at Invictus. So how do you see the, let's say, the inflationary or deflationary picture at this time? And what is the risk of a recession? That's a big question. That's a big question. So uh, maybe we'll give you some high-level thoughts on how the growth cycle, the inflation cycle, and the policy cycle interact, because that'll put a lot of uh, my answers into context. So uh, if we rewind the clock to late 2021, let's think about what was happening. We were starting to see inflation accelerate. The Fed was starting to acknowledge it. They were starting to acknowledge that maybe it was no longer transitory. So uh, they began to signal that they were going to raise rates and tighten monetary policy. So one of the first things that happens when the Fed starts talking about raising rates is rates go up. And a lot of people talk about the Fed funds rate and the Fed funds rate is the policy rate. It's the benchmark rate. But the reality is uh, pretty much the entire US interest rate complex uh, moves with expectations about the Fed funds rate. So that includes corporate credit, that includes long-term rates, and that includes mortgage rates. We're going to focus on mortgage rates for just a second. So when mortgage rates increase, say the 30-year fixed rate mortgage, that puts pretty much immediate downward pressure on demand for housing because uh, getting a mortgage becomes more expensive. So you'll start to see mortgage applications start to decline. That'll happen pretty quickly. We actually saw a very dramatic crash in mortgage applications in 2022. And uh, because rates have remained high, demand for mortgages is still very, very low right now. I think it's still about 53% off of its cycle peak in early 2021. Uh, Reduced demand for housing uh, uh, in turn reduces demand for goods. Uh, Think, um, you know, cars, furniture, home appliances like refrigerators and washing machines. And generally speaking, goods are manufactured. So when the housing cycle starts to slow down, that puts downward pressure on the manufacturing cycle as well. Manufacturers have the choice then between um, cutting production and and keeping their employees, which puts downward pressure on margins, or cutting production and then eventually laying off employees. Given enough time, manufacturing companies will start to lay people off generally. Um, We haven't seen a ton of layoffs yet. Uh, If you look at sort of the headline numbers of payrolls and whatnot, but we are seeing some weakness in the manufacturing sector. Uh, less so in the BLS data, more so in the ADP data. The last, Per the last ADP print, we saw 42,000 net layoffs in the manufacturing sector in June. And uh, we've seen net layoffs in all four of the last four months. BLS has been a little bit stronger. We've only seen layoffs in two of the last four months, but it's still kind of moving in the wrong direction. Um, and then eventually that weakness metastasizes from the manufacturing sector into the services sector. And that's when you start to see uh, sort of a real recession, right? So, so where are we now? Well, we're kind of in the seventh inning of that process by our work at Invictus. We're starting to see weakness in manufacturing, like we just mentioned, um, but it's not enough to create real slack in the labor market yet because the U.S. economy, in terms of payrolls, is about 80% services, just 20% manufacturing. So we haven't seen enough weakness in manufacturing to really spread across the broader economy. 
Consequently, uh, wage growth remains very, very hot. Wage growth is the proximate cause of services and core inflation. So we're still seeing core, core inflation, uh, services inflation running in the 4 to 5% range. So in our view, that will keep policy tight until we see more definitive signs of a recession, uh, which we view as being kind of a December of 2023 event, or maybe even Q1 of 2024. So that's where we think we are in the business cycle right now. So is the Fed responding to the business cycle the only way it knows how? And do you think there there could have been a better path? Uh, it's it's really tough. Uh, and generally at Invictus, we try not to spend too much time talking about what the Fed should do because uh, it's a challenging job. And to be honest, uh, central planning never really works out all that well. And I know that the the central bank doesn't call itself a central planner, but but more or less that's what it's doing is it's it's setting the, the price of money and that's a form of central planning. Uh, we spend more of our time thinking out what the Fed is doing and what that's going to do to the economy because interest rates tend to be a very good leading indicator for housing, like we just said, manufacturing and even services on a long enough lag. And so, um, you know, could the Fed have done something better? Yes, uh, in theory, but I think it's important to acknowledge that kind of what's done is done. The Fed's already tightened policy conditions enough that we're probably going to have the ISM manufacturing PMI slow into the low 40s, that we're probably going to see broad-based layoffs by the beginning of 2024. Uh, this is all baked, baked into the cake, so to speak. And uh, while we wish that policy was was uh, maybe a little bit more prudent, uh, at this point, probably the best thing that we can do as an investor is just to prepare our portfolios for it accordingly. So where in this process does the stock market have its highest correlation? You know, we we talked about manufacturing, we talked about services. What is that what does the stock market typically have the highest correlation to? It's a good it's a good question because I think I myself and certainly a lot of other research providers use the phrase growth, the growth cycle and uh what that means can be a little bit confusing, right? You could be talking about housing cycle, you could be talking about manufacturing, you could be talking about services, payrolls, income, consumption, some sort of composite of all of those things. And the reality is a lot of those tend to be correlated with each other. We found that the time series with the best correlation to the performance of the S&P 500 is the ISM manufacturing PMI, which is of course a measure of the manufacturing cycle, but it tends to lead the rest of the economy. And so it, it tends to have a pretty good relationship uh, with the performance of stock. So we spend a lot of time thinking about the ISM manufacturing PMI, thinking about where it could be in the next three months, six months, nine months. And if that happens, where the stock the stock market would be uh, accordingly. So is this because of the lag time that it takes for the rate hikes to affect the economy? Like, can we use this lag period to predict when the when a real downturn in the economy can occur? Yes. So you, you do have to be careful because the lags are variable. Uh, the, Milton Friedman famously said that monetary policy works on long and variable lags. I think sometimes people use the variability as cover for getting calls incorrect, um, <laughs> which is sort of an easy thing to do. Um, but we all we do know from history and past policy cycles and sort of measuring out the economy uh, that that there does tend to be sort of a, a rhythm to it that you can count on to to, to generally be uh, correct. So. Like I said earlier, when the Fed raises rates, that impacts financial markets right away, right? So when the Fed raises the Fed funds rate, you'll see the 30-year fixed rate mortgage react pretty much instantaneously. You'll see it react that week. Um, so then the housing market slows down. How long does it take for the housing market slow down to transfer into the market for durable goods? Well, maybe three to six months because people, you know, if you if you order a piece of furniture, it doesn't arrive the next day. Um, Prices don't change immediately. There's, you know, delivery issues, and so, um, you know, it takes three to six months for, uh, you know, a housing slowdown to move into the manufacturing sector, right? And then, how long will manufacturing companies allow their margins to erode before they lay people off? Well, you know, that depends on the company, and it depends on, uh, you know, what their pro profit margins were at the beginning of that cycle. It, you know, it depends on, uh, you know, their their capex for the prior cycles and their fixed costs. Um, but generally, we can get a feel for that from looking at historical cycles and um, and and looking at leading indicators and whatnot. So um, that's all to say, yes, and it's something that we spend a, a good deal of time on at Invictus, and we we spend a lot of time on it in our monthly market outlook each month. 
Um, and it's one of the reasons that we think paying attention to market history and studying cycles is so, so important. There's a, there's no such thing as future data. You have to rely on data from the past and let that guide your expectations. And, uh, and so that's what, we, that's what we spend all of our time doing. So I think a, a good example of these lagging pieces of rate hikes is the way that it affects the, the turnover in corporate debt. So have credit conditions tightened severely for, for a lot of corporate uh, borrowers? So it's a, it's a really interesting question, um, and it's kind of a complicated question. So if you look at credit spreads, which are sort of the, the measure of uh, credit conditions that most people look at when they talk about the credit markets, uh, credit spreads have been pretty placid. H- historically, credit spreads have traded on the growth cycle inversely. So when growth is slowing, credit spreads tend to widen. When growth is accelerating, credit spreads tend to contract. And um, over the last year, let's call it the last year, We've seen growth slow pretty dramatically, right? We've seen the ISM manufacturing PMI contract from, I don't have the data in front of me, but let's call it the mid 50s into the mid 40s. Mm-hmm. That's a relatively severe slowdown. But at the same time, credit spreads have declined depending on which one you're looking at by 200, 300 basis points. So that's kind of a relatively unusual situation. Um, our expectation is that, that that divergence will resolve at some point. If we're right about our recession call at the end of this year, beginning of next year, um, there's virtually no chance that credit spreads don't expand. I would add that uh, credit spreads are important and they're a good leading indicator, but they're not a perfect leading indicator. So if you look at the great financial crisis, credit spreads were very, very narrow leading into the great financial crisis, right? They didn't call that recession, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Likewise, credit spreads were very, very narrow heading into COVID. Uh, They didn't call that recession either. So while credit spreads are something that you should look at and they're a very important input into any analysis of financial market conditions, um, they're not infallible. We could also say, you know, when you look at the bank's willing bank's willingness to lend, banks are saying that they are less willing to lend if you look at the senior loan officer survey, right? So uh, the net percentage of banks tightening lending standards is, you know, as high as it's been since the middle of COVID and, you know, before that, the great financial crisis. So banks really don't want to lend. If you look at the percentage of banks reporting stronger demand for loans, it's really, really low. And part of the reason for that is rates are really, really high and capital projects don't make sense when rates are this high, um, at least not for most companies. So, you know, when banks are saying, hey, we don't want to lend and borrowers are saying, hey, we don't really want to borrow, um, you might not see a credit crunch like people were worried about through the regional banking crisis, but you are very likely to see a credit contraction because no one wants to transact. Uh, And typically uh, that's what you would see through a recession. So all this is all this is to say the credit markets kind of look okay right now. Um, but if our outlook sort of comes to pass over the next six months, nine months, uh, uh, credit conditions are going to tighten considerably. Mm-hmm. How about the, the let's say, the absolute level of, of corporate debt? Is the corporate debt burden worse than at other times in, the, in history? And, and what does that tell us about the relative strength of these companies? So I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. Uh, corporate debt as a percentage of GDP is, um, you know, lower than it was in the middle of COVID because GDP was obviously very depressed. I think it's higher than it was at its cycle peak in 2007. Um, but regardless, you're going to get some people who are saying, well, corporate debt's kind of, you know, not really raising any red flags. It hasn't spiked or anything like that. So maybe we don't need to worry about it. And I think what you need to consider is that corporate debt is high relative to, you know, the last several business cycles. And on top of that, interest rates are the highest that they've been in 40 years. And so what that indicates is when people need to refinance their debt, and there's a lot of debt that will need to be refinanced over the next two, three, four, five years and longer, um, that's going to be really, really expensive. And it's going to be particularly expensive for triple C borrowers and lower Uh a lot of these are the zombie companies that that um, some of your guests have been talking about for the last while. And um, these companies are basically going to have to refinance at 15% plus interest rates. These are companies that basically weren't even profitable <laughs> in the middle of 2020 when the Fed was uh, at peak stimulus, right? So I think when they have to refinance at 15% interest, the odds that they go bankrupt or default on their debt somehow and have to lay off employees is, is pretty high. Mm-hmm. So in our view, that's really only a matter of time, right? Um, bank, these companies will have to roll their debt eventually. 
unless there's some reason that rates are much, much lower, which would really only be a depression or excuse me, a recession, probably um, it's going to be bad news for them. Okay. So uh, yeah, that's our take on it. So how, how has this affected the housing market on the other side of that is, is the tightness in the market indicative of a recovery or is there more, more to that picture? So it's a, it's a good question. There's a lot of people that have been talking about the NAHB index ticking higher recently or new home sales ticking up. And they're saying, we're seeing a recovery in the housing market. And um, in our view at Invictus, that's misguided. There's a reason that um, different measures of economic activity for new homes is going up. And the reason is that there's no supply of existing homes, right? Anyone that bought a home prior to 2022 bought it with a sub 4% mortgage rate. I think 80% of existing homeowners today have a sub percent, a sub 4% mortgage attached to that home. And so now that mortgage rates are 6.5%, 7%, it's not that they don't want to give up the home, it's that they don't want to give up the mortgage that they use to finance the home, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, consequently, existing home inventory is almost non-existent, right? It's 50% off of its uh, high in 2016, right? Despite the fact that the working age population of potential buyers is considerably larger today. And so as a result of that, uh, if you do want to buy a home, you really have no choice but to buy a new home, right? All incremental activity in the housing market is being pushed into the market for new homes. And while that's good for home builders, um, and we've been long home builders for the last uh, few months and quarters, uh, it's not a healthy dynamic for the economy, right? So if you want if you want a good measure of the housing market that sort of leads the durable goods cycle and the manufacturing cycle like we were looking at before, you, you really should not be looking at new home sales or even the NAHB index, which we love the NAHB index. It's one of our favorite leading indicators. But in this context, it doesn't make sense to look at it in isolation. You should really be looking at total home sales, right? Because that incorporates the market for existing homes. Because what really drives good spending, dur durable good spending in particular, is you buy a home, you make it your own, you buy furniture, you know, you uh, you know, you add an extra, an extra garage, you buy a new car. And that type of activity tends to correlate with total home sales. It doesn't matter whether you are buying a new home or buying an old home, you still want to make it your own. And so the fact that uh, you know, new, new home sales had uh, you know a twenty percent annualized print doesn't really matter because existing home sales are still within a hair's breadth of a cycle low, and they're they're nearly forty percent off of their cycle peak. So uh, our suggestion would be maybe if you want to track the health of the housing market this cycle, I'd be looking at total home sales. Mike, I think another interesting, let's say, data comparison is the idea that the base effects for inflation have really been acting as a tailwind for bringing inflation prints back down for the for the last little bit here. Does that start to become a headwind again in the near future? Well, I, I think that's that's highly probable. So what is a base effect? A base effect is the impact that a reference point has on any measurement. So when we think about the, the upcoming June CPI print, right? Last June, month over month inflation was 1.2% for the headline number. Um, pretty much whatever we get this June is going to be lower than that. We just don't have enough momentum in the economy to produce a 1.2% CPI month over month print. And what that means is uh, pretty much no matter what, you're going to see a pretty significant decline in the year over year number, right? So probably something around 3.1, 3.2, 3.3%, that, that range. But after that June print rolls off, that, that base effect sort of disappears, right? What was um, something exerting downward pressure on the year-over-year -year numbers will become something uh, exerting an upward pressure, right? And so, um, and all at the same time, all of this is happening. That, that was largely driven by durable goods, right? The, the big source of disinflation over the last 12 months has been durable goods, and you're going to see the base effects start to roll off starting in July. At the same time, services inflation, core inflation, wage-sensitive measures of inflation are still comping in the 4 to 5% range. And so uh, you're going to start to see upward pressure into that range unless you see slack start to develop in the labor market. And that's still our view in the back half of this year. But in the event that it doesn't happen, uh, it's good to know what the underlying drivers of inflation are going to be sort of pu pushing the most important measures 
forward. So, so you know, what's the economic gravity going to be pushing headline and core inflation at, and how will the Fed likely react in those scenarios? So, again, our view is that we probably see a recession late Q4 of this year, beginning of 2023. But in the event that it doesn't happen, we want to be plan- paying attention to these uh, underlying inflation dynamics. You know, Mike, you mentioned at the end there the way that the Fed ends up reacting to these inflationary prints. What data is suggesting that the Fed could keep rates elevated and or higher from here at this point? So I think what's keeping rates so, so high right now is a combination of very low, a very low headline unemployment rate and very high wage growth. So what could keep uh, rates, what could continue to keep rates high? It's a continuation of that dynamic, right? Low unemployment uh, feeding into faster wage growth, feeding into fast or faster core inflation. Um, Our view at Invictus is that this doesn't persist, right? We're already seeing weakness in the manufacturing sector. When we were describing our outlook of the business cycle, we said we were in the seventh inning. we, we continue to think that. We continue to see evidence that the cycle is kind of progressing at a normal pace and that we will probably see more widespread layoffs at the end of this year and the beginning of next year. That said, if we're wrong, that would be evidence of the higher for longer case, right? If you if we continue to see, for example, if we saw a goods recovery, if we started to see um, you know, net hiring in the manufacturing sector and a recovery of new orders for durable goods, um, that'd be evidence that our thesis is wrong and that higher for longer is going to remain the MO for longer than we originally expected. So what about on the other side? Is there is there data that could suggest that the Fed might be, you know, taking another another break here and or lowering rates? I don't really see any evidence of that yet. Again, when I, th- I think when you look at why are we still seeing four or five percent inflation and in services and core inflation? Well, it's really because the labor market we're in aggregate, right? The broad headline numbers remain so, so strong. So I think as long as you see really, really strong employment, the Fed isn't going to take its foot off the gas. Even if you disagree with the economic logic of what I'm saying, this is how the Fed sees it, right? And so they're the ones that make policy. It's not me and it's not you. So it's important to sort of see the world from their perspective and and think about what they're going to do, given the mental models and frameworks that they're operating off of. So given that, um, I think the labor market is is really the thing to watch here uh, in terms of what policy is going to look like next. Mm-hmm. Mike, I want to spend a little bit of time, you know, discussing the ideas of signals that many pay attention to. For example, the yield curve and how it relates to recession and signaling, you know, showing when a recession is very likely. Has that signal broken or lost its reliability as an indicator of the slowing economy over the past two years? So in my in my opinion, no. Um, the yield curve is famously a recession signal or recession predictor. Um, the problem with it is that it tends to lead by such a long period of time that by the time the signal really becomes most relevant, people have forgotten about it, right? If you remember when the yield curve uh, originally inverted a year ago, or called the two tens curve, I think it was. Um, there are tons of headlines about it. I haven't seen a headline about the yield curve in a long time at this point. So if you look, if you look back at the last sixty or seventy years of history, the yield curve has inverted before every recession, but it's inverted with a lead time of between nine and twenty-seven months. Um, that's kind of a confusing way of framing it because a recession is an NBER determination, right? And it's made on a discretionary basis on the basis of uh, income growth, consumption growth, employment growth. And um, the truth is it doesn't really matter to us as investors. What really matters is the growth cycle, right? Um, and we really like looking at the ISM manufacturing PMI. So that's that tends to be how we frame it. Mm-hmm. And by our work, uh, the yield curve tends to lead the ISM manufacturing PMI by about 12 months. And so uh, what that indicates is we should start to see the signal from the yield curve become more important uh, in the coming, you know, three months or so. Now, now keep in mind, the yield curve is just one input into our investment outlook. So we track a host of leading indicators of which the yield curve is just one. The yield curve would probably suggest that we, you know, really start to see more significant weakness in the labor market, you know, in the next month or two. Uh, Given everything else that we're looking at, we think it's probably closer to the end of 2023, like we said November, December, maybe Q1 of 2024. We don't think the yield curve has lost any of its potency. 
Uh, we don't think it's lost any of its economic signal, um, but we just have to respect the fact that the lags are long and variable and hopefully that doesn't sound like a cop out, but in this case, it's, it's true. You know, I think one of the other kind of interesting pieces of, you know, research of yours that I came across was the percentage gain in, in previous bear markets, you know, for example, after the great financial crisis. So give us a little bit of context for this current run in the S&P, if this is a recovery and if if there is historical context for runs like that, for example, after the great financial crisis. Right. It's a, it's a good question. It's really funny. I've, I know I've heard, I'm sure you've heard this too, but I've heard the phrase economic recovery a lot recently in the last, you know, three or four months or so people say we're in a recovery. Well, what are we recovering from? Are we recovering from full employment? Are we re- recovering from high interest rates that are still extremely high? Um, it doesn't really make any sense. And there's, of course, the technical description of markets where you say if, if you're 20% off of a trough, you're in a new bull market. Mm-hmm. Um, that is sort of an arbitrary definition. And actually, if you look at historic bear markets, it doesn't really hold water. So if you look at the great financial crisis, the S&P 500 had several 20% rallies, uh, bear market rallies, where the index afterward went on to make new lows. And the Russell actually had a 34% rally. If you really want to be extreme, you could go back to the dot-com bubble and look at the NASDAQ. It had several rallies over 50%, right? And went on to make new lows. So just picking a random number and saying, well, if it if you see a bear market rally more than this or that, it's a, it's a new bull market. It doesn't really make a lot of economic sense. Now, obviously, we also recognize that the NASDAQ from the year 1999 or 2000 or 2001, it doesn't have the same volatility characteristics as the S&P 500 today. But uh, this is is just to say your work on the business cycle and the economy and the markets should probably be a little more sophisticated than just, well, 20% plus rally equals new bull market equals go max long. Um, (laughs) I think that's that's probably a recipe for uh, pain pain in your portfolio. Mm -hmm. So how do you separate the world of of commodities and how do they each respond to different parts of the business cycle? It's a great question. It's commodities is a really interesting market because it's a market that has physical participants as well as um, speculators, right? So there's no physical market for S&P 500 futures, but there are people that want to buy copper to use for industrial activities, right? Um, So there's a lot of economic signal in looking at the commodity market. And it tells you not just about expectations, but also about What's going on right now? So, if you were just to look at the CRB Commodity Index, which is like the S and P 500 of commodities, right? It's a basket of commodities. Generally speaking, commodities are a reflationary exposure, right? They tend to perform best when economic growth is accelerating and when inflation is accelerating, and they tend to do worse when growth and inflation are declining. That said, it's helpful to break down commodities into buckets because not all commodities are created equal, and they trade with different sensitivities to different things. So um, we divide commodities into four baskets. We divide them into energy commodities, industrial metals, also called base metals, agricultural commodities, and um, and precious metals, right? So probably the most important commodity in the world with the most economic significance is oil. Oil tends to have a very close correlation with the good cycle, uh, with the ISM manufacturing PMI. And the reason is that oil is an input into pretty much everything from Tupperware to your car to asphalt to roofing materials. Oil is in pretty much everything, right? So it's an incredibly important constituent of the economic cycle. Moreover, you know, given the logic of what I just said, it makes sense that oil also is very highly correlated with inflation. It actually leads headline CPI inflation by about three months. So if you're looking to create a basic forecasting model for inflation, starting with the price of oil is not a bad idea, not bad at all. Um, industrial metals tend to be a little less correlated with inflation. So we're thinking copper, steel, aluminum, uh, and a little bit more correlated with the real growth cycle. That should make sense. Again, they're highly correlated with things like autos, right? I think the typical car uses 50 pounds of copper. I think it's 200 pounds of steel, a lot of aluminum. Electric cars are even more metal intensive than traditional internal combustion engine cars. So we don't think that dynamic is going to change. Um, Maybe it goes with, I'm sure all of your listeners know, oil is down some 45% off of its cycle peak last March. Uh, 
Industrial metals in aggregate have been getting absolutely slammed. The last time I checked, the LME index, which is an index of industrial metals, was down about 35% from its peak. Um, so this is all confirmation that um, what's happening in the real real world right now is slower growth. So earlier we said credit spreads weren't confirming what we see when we look at the data. Industrial metals clearly are, right? Industrial metals have been getting totally smashed. Agricultural commodities, that's the third category. Think soybeans, corn, wheat, orange juice, stuff like that, tend to have the least economic significance. Um, when when we, we, we do track those commodities as well, and they are generally reflationary, but they're more idiosyncratic. There's more stuff going on there than just the good cycle. It's seasonal. There's weather. There's you know farmers making decisions about their individual farms. Um, and so we spend a little bit less time on that. It's a little hard to deduce really useful information from there. And then finally, there's precious metals, gold, silver, palladium, platinum, gold obviously being uh, the most important. So gold, if you want to get gold right, you really have to get real rates right, real interest rates right. And you can think of that, you can think of the logic behind that as gold is non-interest bearing money, right? It's, it's, it's money, but it doesn't pay you a coupon. You can think of treasuries as interest bearing money, right? So it's, you know, very few, it's fungible with cash and it pays an interest rate. So as a result, uh, when real interest rates are rising, gold tends to underperform. And when real interest rates are declining, gold tends to perform very well. Um, obviously, we just had an aggressive hiking cycle where rates went up and gold sort of treaded water, even though inflation was accelerating. That said, uh, if you ran a regression, gold actually outperformed given what rates were doing, uh, which when an, a financial asset is doing something that it shouldn't be doing, that should get your attention because that tells you there's some sort of underlying fundamental dynamic that's that's concurrently being priced in. And it might be something interesting that you uh, you could be getting along later. And so, you know, just on the basis of our back test, when's the best time to buy gold? Well, the best time to buy gold is probably when the Fed um, stops cutting or excuse me, stops hiking interest rates or even starts cutting interest rates. We don't expect that probably until, you know, the end of this year at some time. The, the summary of economic projection says the Fed expects another two hikes. We generally agree with that. So um, as the Fed raises rates a couple more times, that'll put downward pressure on gold. But look, when there's a recession, gold is absolutely something you want to own in a diversified portfolio, especially through kind of a conventional cutting cycle. And you know, make make no mistake, despite the Fed's rhetoric, we do expect a conventional cutting cycle. It might take a little bit longer to play out because the Fed's going to want to stomp out the last sparks of inflation before it starts cutting. Um, but in our view, it, it will cut. It will cut eventually, probably sometime in 2024. Gold will probably perform, start performing better. It'll probably break out of that base around $2,000 an ounce ahead of that because markets are discounting mechanisms. But um, that's when we would really start to add to our gold position and size. We don't mind having a starter position in gold here. We think uh, we have a fairly high level of confidence. That is going to be how things play out. We're not as confident in terms of the timing, which is why it's a starter position and not a full size position. But that's what we would look for in terms of sizing that position up. Gotcha. So gold, you know, when we hear that it is a, a hedge against inflation, is that not correct? And is it more correlated or better understood? through the lens of looking at its correlation to real rates? In a stable financial regime, it's not correlated with inflation. And historically, the United States has been a stable financial regime and the dollar has been the, the primary reserve asset. And then in that scenario, right, you should be looking more at real rates. If you expect a complete collapse of US civilization, or if you live in another country, um, you know, where the currency is going to be completely debased in the next five years or so, um, then, of course, gold is a great hedge against inflation, as are most real assets. Given that our view is that the dollar system remains largely intact for at least the next 10 years, we would be, as US dollar investors, we would be trading gold more based on its relationship with real rates and sort of conventional correlations rather than assuming a brand new regime, at least not right now. Excellent, Mike. That's most of what I have to kind of go over with you today. Is there anything else that is on the top of your mind that you'd like to touch on before we wrap up? Uh, I guess maybe one thing I, I'd like to touch on is we talk a lot about policy and rates and the impact of rates in the financial markets. 
But something that's really important not to forget and, and not hopefully doesn't get lost in all of this economic talk is that when the Fed raises rates, it makes holding cash more attractive, right? And, and right now you can buy short-term treasury bills or similar money market assets with yields of 5%, 5.5%. That's really, really attractive, especially if economic growth continues to slow, the Fed continues to keep policy tight, and eventually we see a recession. A nominally risk-free 5.5% against that economic backdrop is very attractive, right? And a lot of people have lost money trying to buy a very narrow market in stocks this year. And uh, if you're looking for a very low risk alternative to that, um, there, there are plenty of treasury ETFs and other money market funds that offer a very, very good return. So, so keep in mind that that's worth looking at right now. Excellent, Mike. And share a little bit about where more people can find information if they'd like to. So you can find me at uh, invictus-research.com. We're actually doing a promotion on our research combo. The discount code is macro trial, capital M, capital T. That includes uh, our monthly market outlook, which we referenced in this video, weekly trade ideas, and our flagship product, the Daily Edge. It goes over the prior day's economic data releases, puts them in the context of the business cycle, talks about back tests, the economic linkages between wages, inflation, growth, et cetera. And, uh, really aims to make hedge fund quality research available for everyone at a very affordable price point. Wonderful, Mike. And of course, on Twitter as well, at Invictus Macro, right? Right. Perfect. Thanks so much for your time today, Mike. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Tom. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.